If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to cover a lot of ground today. So, moving toward the end of this series in which we've been exploring the character of God as He's revealed Himself to us through the Scripture, really exploring the doctrine of the Trinity, and has been spending really the last month and a half on the Holy Spirit. The reason we've been spending so much time on the Holy Spirit is because the Spirit is so often misunderstood. And I even would confess for myself that as I've studied the work of the Holy Spirit and have really just opened myself up in prayer to, Holy Spirit, show me what you want to do in and through our church and give me a clear vision and understanding. Help me to be open to what the scriptures say about you. Because we all kind of come with our, our different lenses by which we consider the work of the Spirit. And the church has come up with many ways to deal with the, the things that the Scripture says about the Spirit. Because the Spirit, often, the things that are said about the Spirit's activity make us, quite frankly, uncomfortable. And, and so I think the, the best thing we can do is just come to the, humbly come to the Scriptures and just say, Lord, what do you want to teach us? And how does it align with our commitment to Jesus. And so what I want to explore today is the, the very confrontation, or excuse me, uh, controversial subject of the gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> Confrontational. I will probably confront you as well. Uh, and I've confronted myself. In fact, I ended last service and I'm like, did I just open up that? I did. Uh, so, you know, what I want us to think about today is is what are we expecting God to do through our community? What is the vision that God has given us as a church? And do you, as one who is sitting in a seat listening to me speak right now, do you feel ownership for this community? Do you feel like you're actually a part of it? Do you come and just watch Tim and I preach week after week and sing some songs that you enjoy? Or do you feel that you yourself are called to be a covenant partner with the living God to further the mission of Jesus in the city of Portland? And do you believe that God has actually done what he said he would do, which is give his spirit to not only be with us, but to actually dwell within us and to impart to us the power necessary to live extraordinary lives for Jesus? And this is something that I've been really wrestling with because my deepest desire for this church is that we would take seriously the call that God has put upon us to be witnesses to Jesus. And for some reason, we get extremely uncomfortable with the work of the Spirit, especially when you get into the gifts. Now, it depends on what your background is, but I'll just share right out, of the, right out of the gate that my background is Calvary Chapel, which Calvary Chapel believes in the gifts of the Spirit, but the joke is that we don't use them because they make us uncomfortable. Um, and so it's like, do I believe the gifts are for today? Absolutely. Do you use No, I wouldn't. That was, like, it's weird really fast. And that's not true. It's like I'm selective with the gifts that I'm comfortable with. I believe in the gift of preaching, or I wouldn't be doing it, or the gift, the, the supernaturally empowered prayer, or of the gift of evangelism. I even believe in that prophetic moment in which the Spirit seems to just dominate the temperament and give a direct word for the people where they're at. But then there are those other gifts, like how do I feel about healing? How do I feel about the miraculous, the casting out of demons? How do I feel about, about speaking in tongues? Honestly, I feel uncomfortable often about those things. And then I realized that a lot of that's just due to my actual temperament, that my temperament is reserved. Like, I was the kid that got embarrassed easily when people did weird things. And you ever have friends that, you know, there are two different kinds of temperaments, and so you may fall into these categories, and it often depends on what you grew up in. If you grew up in a conservative church where maybe the doctrinal background that you come from is what's called cessationist, which is that the gifts of the Spirit ceased with the close of the canon of Scripture because Scripture is all we need. We don't need miracles and signs and wonders um, to believe in Jesus. And there is truth in that, that, that the testimony of the gospel is powerful and the greatest miracle that we can experience is the miracle of regeneration. I would never deny that. 
But if that's your background, then when you start coming to the text where we look at the scriptures and then Paul starts talking about things, radical things that are happening and seems to be promoting them. Uh, and we read the book of Acts and we see all sorts of things and we don't find any verse anywhere in the New Testament that says that the gifts of the Spirit ceased, then I'm forced, I'm a biblicist first and foremost. And I don't care what the tradition is. If the Bible doesn't support it, I reject it. I have to. And so, so this is the dilemma that I find myself in because then I'm open to things that I'm not actually that comfortable with. And, the, and what the church has done with these chapters, uh, what we're going to look at, this chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is just pretty much ignored it. Or they've abused it. And see, I think that that's the other side. If you come from a charismatic background where you saw things just used just in a, in a, in a really unfortunate fashion where the emphasis was all upon the sensational and the spectacular, there can already be like, you, you're like, I don't like where this conversation is going. And so there, it's kind of a... a it becomes an uncomfortable subject to, to broach, you know, as pastors Tim and I were talking about, and I felt like he was just relieved that he didn't have to do it, because both of us are extremely reserved. I'm like, I'm like, you're open to the gifts of the Spirit, right, Tim? He's like, yeah, of course. I'm like, do you want anyone to use some of those gifts in the service? He's like, no. I'm like, me neither. So what do we do with this chapter? <laughs> And I, I was sharing the last year, it's like, I was thinking the, the difference in temperaments, you know, the, the person who has no inhibitions, that's how some, when I read this, I'm like, these are just a, a church of people with no inhibitions. And it's like, and then there's the modest people, and, and, and we live in Portland, I mean, what happened last night? You're like, oh, thank you, naked 40-year-old woman on a bicycle for driving by my 8-year-old girl, I appreciate that. I mean, our city seems to be quite comfortable with extraordinary things, including 8,000 people on bicycles last night naked, running through my neighborhood, even at midnight. What's up with that? I'm like sitting, trying to read my Bible. I'm working on my sermon, and like at like 1130 at night, like I just hear, woo, and like whistles blow, and I look out, and there's naked people wrapped in blue glow lights, and I'm like, which made them look extremely disgusting and pasty and bluish <laughs> and dimply. It was really a, the whole thing, and they were like older. They were like older than me. So it was really, I'm like, man, these people are just really enjoying themselves right now. Um, but I, I, I was struck by just the, the comedy of even of what I was trying to prepare of like how my own heart becomes extremely modest when it comes to the outworking of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to just confess to you that I'm wrestling with that, but I want to be true to the scripture. What's fascinating about this chapter, if I was to give you the context, is that the Apostle Paul was dealing with a church that was actually rich in spiritual gifts, but lacking in love. It was a church that was actually rich in their expressions of, uh, in, in the ability for the Spirit to work through the community, but they were carnal. They were, they were actually abusing the gifts they were using the gifts to exalt individuals. It was creating division in the church. It was basically a mess. And what I would say is that Corinth was essentially the first Pentecostal church. It didn't start 100 years ago. I mean, Corinth really has all the markings of, of what can be the Wild West in extreme charismatic movements where there just doesn't seem to be any sort of parameter on how things are expressed. Like, Jesus said, this is, you know, it's like those who just, like he said that serpents can bite you and you can drink poison and you're, you're going to be healed. And there are churches that just take that seriously and they practice that. And it's just that kind of just, just almost reckless abandon when it comes to, I'm going to grab a hold of everything that Jesus promised. And, but the emphasis becomes on the sensational rather than on Jesus. And so this is the danger. And so Paul is calling the church back to a place of order. And what he does is really brilliant. And he begins here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. And he says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, or if I was to actually give you a, a literal translation there, gifts actually doesn't occur. In fact, I think it's an unfortunate translation. Gifts comes later in this chapter. It should just say, now about the things of the Spirit, or now about, literally, spiritualities. Spiritual realities. You've been focusing on carnal realities. Let me bring you back to true spiritual realities. Now, the reason we don't translate it that way in English is because 
Spiritual for us means esoteric, but spiritual in the New Testament means God's ability to animate or bring life to a person, to a community, to a church. God's ability to animate or bring supernatural life to our individual temperaments and gift sets, or even beyond that, actually bring gifts in that we didn't even have before. And so I, I, I want to use, I want to be careful not to just simply call it the gifts because it's all things that the Spirit does in the church is what Paul's getting at here. He says, now about the spiritualities, about Spirit-filled reality, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. And what he's saying is, I want you to understand the things of the Spirit because it is a lack of understanding ignorance that puts the church in danger of false teaching i need you to have understanding and and he says you know that when you were pagans somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols therefore i want you to know that no one who is speaking by the spirit of god says jesus be cursed and so there must have been giving that you know people were receiving all kinds of words that had nothing to do with jesus and so paul is trying to bring attention back it's like we got to recreate the the safeguard. We need to put rails on, you know. It's like the bowling alley of those, the rails that keep the ball from going in the gutter. It's like, we got to put that on the exercising of the gifts. We need to put training wheels back on here because you're getting out of hand. You're getting off track. You're going in, you're going into the gutter with how you're exercising the gifts. And so he says, He's like, he calls them to A, first of all, look back and remember what the primary work of the Spirit is. And what was that primary work? Because they were once influenced and led astray by all sorts of, of, of spiritual influences. False idols, which had demonic powers behind them, as he has already addressed in the book of Corinthians. The influences and the, and the spirit of the age. We considered this just a few weeks back. There was all kinds of influences. But you remember what happened when the Spirit of God revealed to you the reality of what? Jesus. The first thing the Spirit shows to us as people is not, is not, look what you can have. Look at the goodies you get when you follow Jesus. No, the first thing that the Spirit does, even when it's in the form of a, of a sign or a wonder or a miracle or anything, is to point people to Jesus. And this is exactly what he says. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so essentially what he's saying is, here we begin. This is the safeguard for the exercising of spiritual realities. It has to reveal Jesus is Lord. The Holy Spirit is not the forgotten God. The Holy Spirit is the shy person in the Godhead because he constantly redirects our attention to Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't exalt Jesus as Lord, then we have to be wary of of what it is exalting. And this is why one of the deepest needs in the church today is discernment. Because Paul himself writes in other letters, he says, the day is coming when, when men and women will no longer even accept sound doctrine, but they will heap up for themselves teachers who will basically scratch their itching ears, that will feed them doctrines that make somehow the gospel more palatable for a modern age. And in doing so, they diminish the work of Jesus, and it, and it creates nothing but death in the church. And so Paul says, we got to begin here. We want the Spirit to move and bring freedom. In fact, the Spirit does just that. When the church is reluctant to surrender to the Lordship of the Holy Spirit, what happens is that we become powerless. In fact, we can't truly be the church without the Spirit. In fact, I want to go as far as to say the Spirit Himself is the sovereign Lord of the church. He is our leader. For it is the Spirit of Christ Himself And we have to recognize that the community, in order to function in the Spirit, must be grounded in the gospel. We are grounded in the gospel and then awakened, maintained, gifted, and ruled by the Holy Spirit. But it has to be grounded in the gospel. It has to. This is why 1 John 4, verses 1 and 2, John says the same thing. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit 
But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Notice what he says. Here's how you know God's Spirit. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. In other words, the Spirit always acknowledges and exalts the gospel of Christ, that God became man for us. It's powerful. But so once we have that established, then we, then we have to begin to move out then in faith. And we have to move out of our, our, our insecurities and our, and our fears. And we have to begin to let the Spirit be the sovereign that He must be for the church to be vibrant. And I think that the danger of us being reluctant to be open to the Holy Spirit's movement is that we run the risk of what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Literally, suppress Him. Push Him down because you're uncomfortable with Him. Isn't it funny that we get nervous around the things of the Spirit and we act like if we didn't have to talk about the Spirit, like if we didn't talk about miracles and signs and wonders and tongues and prophecy, then people would be more willing. The reason we shouldn't talk about it is because then people will not think our faith is weird. Listen, if you're a Christian, you're weird, Com- to the, according to the world. You're like, what is not weird about saying, I believe that God created a world that went wayward, so wayward that it was incapable of saving itself, so God did the unthinkable and entered into his own creation, took upon himself humanity, God, the creator of the universe, the one who is spirit that no man has seen, actually came into sinful, broken flesh, lived the perfect life that you couldn't live, upon the cross became some sort of acceptable sin offering, and that God himself became both the judge and the judged, dealing with our brokenness so that we wouldn't have to be judged, and that Jesus rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and then sent His Spirit to to live within people, but the Spirit doesn't actually do anything because that would be weird. You're like, it just took a second. You're like, it's not weird. It's actually really normal. (laughs) No, it's not. It's weird. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. That's why Paul says, I am not ashamed. And I think one of the things that quenches the Spirit and grieves the Spirit and insults the Spirit is our shame of the gospel. But Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. There's power in it. And the power is God's very presence. And this is what I want us to understand, is that this chapter is not so much about the the gifts that the Spirit gives but the gift of the Spirit Himself, who sovereignly dispenses as He sees fit. And He exalts Jesus as Lord. Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We don't suppress the Spirit because it doesn't make sense. We don't grieve the Holy Spirit with our sin because God lives within you, and this is why sin must go. Should we sin that grace may abound? Paul says, absolutely not. But we allow the Spirit of God to come in and bring sanctification to our life. And it's not until we begin to be clean vessels, clean conduits. Now, sin will always be a part of our reality as long as we dwell within these fallen bodies. But we can come under the control of the Spirit. This is why Paul encourages the church to keep on being filled. And so we come under the Spirit's control that we might not grieve Him. Isn't it fascinating that this language, quenching, grieving, speaks of personality, not just power. He is a personality with absolute power, but he is not power without personality. He is someone. And when we begin to think of the Spirit of God as literally God with us, within us, working through us, then we begin to see the seriousness of making God partake of our sinfulness. It creates an awareness and the need for holiness Finally, Hebrews 10, 29 says, how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? It's fascinating language. The most serious, obviously, is Jesus himself saying, he says, 
every sin committed shall be forgiven, even a sin or insult against the Son of Man. But the sin that can never be forgiven is the sin against the Holy Spirit, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And what he means by that is rejecting that which the Spirit came to exalt, Jesus. And so people ask me, how do, what, how do I not... How do I know if I've, if I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit? You wouldn't be sitting here if you had. Because the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is an absolute rejection, an intentional, purposeful rejection of the gospel when you know it to be the only truth. And so, so here is our beginning. This is our litmus test. Before we can talk about the gifts, we have to set our parameters. Jesus is Lord. And the gift is the Spirit Himself. And then that opens us up to a willingness, what should bring about is a willingness to yield to the Spirit's sovereignty to dispense as He sees fit what the church needs for you to take ownership of what God is doing in our midst and what He wants to do through our community. And so look with me now at verses 4 through 7. So here you see the Spirit's diversity in and through the community and what it should accomplish. It says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, of, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now, notice that the Spirit's deep desire is to, is to animate or empower, infuse us with divine presence, not for the purpose of satisfying self, but for the purpose of building up the community of faith, that we are called into a family and the gifts that are given and distributed and the, uh, the services and the workings of the Spirit are for the purpose of bringing about a common good into the church. It brings unity. The diversity, um, the diversified ways in which the Spirit works in the church is for the purpose of creating one healthy, holistic body that together proclaims the gospel of Jesus. And what that says is that there is not a person here that is unimportant to God who is not called to be used by God um, and to use what God has given you in the context of community and faith. In fact, people often say, well, how do I know what my gift is? Well, ask yourself the question, what do I like to do? And, you know, unless it's something really dumb, you know, like, I like to steal. Well, that's not, he's not going to empower that. <laughs> but <laughs> what about kill? No, probably not that either. But, <laughs> but what do you, what, what, where, where's your wheelhouse? Some people are, they're just naturally friendly. The, the Spirit can in, empower that, infuse that. I like to talk. Maybe you, maybe the Spirit wants to empower that or silence you. I don't know, but you need to be open to it. And the, and the thing is, is that you will never discover your gifts apart from being within community because nobody is called to go, I've got the gift of teaching or preaching because it's usually that one or I'm supposed to be a worship leader. Has anyone else ever told you you're supposed to be a worship leader? No. Can you sing? Not really, but I'm pretty sure that's what God told me. We have no way of, it's not been proven. It's not been tested. And so we live together in the midst of community amongst one another, and that's how we begin to discover the gifts. It takes someone in the community to recognize where the Spirit is potentially working in your life, because you're not called to examine your own heart in that way. We're not called to analyze our belly buttons. We're called to step out in faith and begin to live as a family, not for ourselves, but for one another. And so look at what he says here. He goes, there are various kinds of gifts. This word is where we get the word charisma, it's where we get the word grace, essentially. There are various graces that come from the Spirit. And it says there's the same Spirit distributes these graces, these gifts, this charisma, as He sees fit. Now the question is, is what does that actually mean? Does that mean that it's some new thing that is given to me after I become born again? Possibly. But it doesn't always mean that. What it means, uh, Gary Brashear sent me his little, he found out I was preaching on this, and he goes, of course, I'd like to influence your sermon on this, and I'm grateful for him because he gave me a very helpful, in fact, I'm thinking about making this, he made a one-page, like, statement on 
the gifts of the Spirit that I'll probably make available on the website somehow. I'll talk to Evan about that. Um, But he says that it is any ability you have that the Spirit can pick up, animate, magnify, and repurpose to carry on the work of Jesus. That's such a great first side definition. Any, Any gift within you, any gift, natural gifts, you're, that's what I said about Jamie. She, she's administrative. I think the Holy Spirit gave her a supernatural ability to go beyond and uh, above and beyond what was even her natural gifting because she was handling the administration for a church that usually would have at the size that would have a staff of about 20. And she was doing it with the help of her and Evan together. Were basically Because I, I don't, that's not the gift the Spirit has ever given me or ever will. Um, my wife will say yes and amen to that. And that's, it's true. And so, they, so you can take, or my, my uh, I would say in my 20s, there are people that just have, there are people that just have charisma. And, and, and I, I think most, you think about it, most actors, like rock stars, they have what we call the X factor. That it's that thing that people are just drawn to and you can't even really put your finger on what it is. It's just a temperament that people just want to be around. And, and I've seen that in space. Two, two individuals that I've seen that in the church that are just like, and they're just literally magnets for people is Luis Palau and Greg Laurie, who are the two great, like, huge, huge scale evangelists I know. And they're just, they're one, they're, they're both of them are guys that when they're in a room, you just know someone of importance is there. And the, the danger is I've seen it in stars, and it's all self-importance. But I've seen God infuse that charisma and use it to draw people to Jesus. And I, I think that on a small scale, that was my, probably one of my gifts in my 20s because my band wasn't very good, but I was a charismatic temperament. I maybe convinced people that my really bad band was reasonable and that they should come uh, and, and watch me try to be a rock star. But it was fascinating. The gospel so radically transformed my life that the Lord pushed me reluctantly into a place of leadership and, and, and infuses that, and my prayer is that it always infuses it with a, in a way that draws people and points people to Jesus. In fact, I heard a great story of Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker, two preachers in England uh, around the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, and this reporter went to hear both of them preach. And so he went and heard Joseph Parker preach in the morning and then Spurgeon preach at night. And after, Parker was known for being extremely handsome, He had this white mane, and he was like six foot four, and he had this incredibly eloquent voice. Uh, And the reporter, after hearing Parker preach, said, what a preacher. But then he went and saw Spurgeon, who was like five foot six, a little stout. I call him a little, very stout. And uh, and after the sermon, he said, what a savior. And I think that both of them had probably in spades charisma (laughs) but the charisma for one unfortunately and i think i've benefited from parker's sermons i think he loved jesus but i think there was mixture i mean there's a story of parker wanting a statue of himself put in front of his church that's incredible (laughs) you imagine (laughs) that's lame but it'd be awesome if it was tim and i No, 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 it's about you, man. <laughs> and we think about, <laughs> I was actually just imagining what the statue would look like. Uh, yeah, I, I think that this is the thing, is, it, is how, does the, how does the Lord take the natural gifts and supernaturally impose them? But then there are other gifts that come that, that are clearly, they, these aren't gifts that you were born with, they're just things that come in. The prophetic word, the ability to heal. The the ability to cast out demons. These aren't things that just happen in the scriptures. They're things that have happened. They've happened in this last year. And I've seen personally. Do they happen all the time? No. In some places in the world they do. All the time. And I think that the, the thing is, is that what I want you to understand is that the spirit is sovereign and he dispenses these gifts as he sees fit. It's not our place to decide when and where. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we lack faith if we're not seeing that prevalent all the time. What we have to trust is that the Spirit is sovereign over the church and He will dispense to the church as it needs. 
And if the church just needs scripture preached and your heart's fed and more discernment, awesome. Great. But if he wants to do more than that, we need to be open to it. So look at what else he says here. I think this is fascinating. He says various kinds of service, not just various kinds of gifts, but he says various kinds of service. And here, I think Gary's uh, little piece was helpful. He says, this is where we get that word deacon. And it's just the place or role or office where believers are called by God to serve inside or outside the church. Uh, And we see a list of this um, as follows from Ephesians chapter 4 when it says, in verses 11 and 12, so Christ himself gave the apostles. And the apostles, there's the, the first apostles, but I think the apostolic gift continues today, but it's, it's in a small a way, and that would be, I think, those who have the ability to actually catalyze and pioneer something new, to begin a movement, essentially. Uh, and, and I think that, that a true church planter um, should have that apostolic office, that ability to where people will follow and they'll be, they're able to actually start something that, that begins a new work in a new place. I think that my friend Mike Doyle has this in New York City. Who goes to New York without knowing anyone and starts a church in Manhattan and have 200 plus people within two years? That's crazy. I mean, that's, that's a daunting task. I mean I, like I, I mean, I consider myself a pioneering personality and I was like, wow, how'd you do that? And that's like, and I think that that's an apostolic. He's, he's an, he has an evangelistic gift set. He's a strong preacher, and he's very pastoral, and he has that ability to, to catalyze and visioneer something and make it happen. And I think that that's a supernaturally imparted reality. And those, these are the, that, the various kinds of service. But it says the apostles, the prophets, these are, these are men and women who um, are, come under the complete domination of the Spirit and are given uh, a word for the church. Now, let me just say this about prophecy. Prophecy is the one that Paul says in chapter 14 that, uh, that he desires all to prophesy when he's rebuking the church for misusing tongues and making that the supreme gift in the church. And so the question is immediately, well, what is meant by prophecy? What is meant by that? And to prophesy, I, I do believe it is that it's, it's different than the Old Testament because we live in a time between ages, and, and we have to remember the very principle that I started with. What does it say in Revelation? That Jesus is the spirit of, does anyone know? Prophecy. It says Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy in the Old Testament would often mean new revelation. It was generally focused on judgment toward God's people and surrounding nations. Prophecy in the New Testament, according to 1 Corinthians 14, is meant to bring encouragement, comfort, and exhortation to the church. It's a word that God puts into an individual who is yielded so fully to the Spirit that it, that it comes through them as a conduit. And it has to be different from teaching or preaching, or there wouldn't be distinction in the New Testament. And there's constantly distinguished between all these different roles. Preaching is different from teaching. How do we think of, of teaching? Look at, he says, not only in, in, does he give, uh, he gives apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor and teacher. I think of this, when it comes to uh, preaching and teaching, the example of that is Tim and I. Tim is probably the purest teacher I have ever heard in my life, which is why I hired him. Because that's not my primary gift. He, and what does a teacher do? Think about what teachers do. They have this incredible ability um, to have, I think, illuminated insight into the scripture that brings total clarity to the people. He has the ability to take complex, through 14 years of schooling, plus the Holy Spirit, he can bring, and, and schooling doesn't make a man a great teacher, but God used him schooling and then has given him an incredible and natural way in which he communicates to people um, and brings clarity and understanding to the scriptures. And when he's functioning in that like fully, I mean, really, I honestly think he's one of the best Bible expositors, if not the best on the West Coast. Um, I would maybe go even further than that, but I, I don't want him to be embarrassed when he listens to the sermon. Um, but, I, but think about preaching. Preaching I would say, is, is more of my gift set, evangelism and preaching. And preaching and evangelism come, I think that they have two sides of the same thing. Preaching is, uh, is 
conviction that brings confrontation. <laughs> and, and I think evangelism is passion that brings conviction. Conviction. And, and that is more my strong suit. It's driven by the desire to exhort. It's that word for the people right now. This is what God, Tim teaches and you want to read your Bible. And I think I preach and, and hopefully you want to do something. And that's why together, I think it creates a healthy balance for the church because we need to be fed, we need to learn, we need to grow, but we also need to be challenged, we need to be convicted, and we need to see salvation come to people. But does that mean that Tim never exercises evangelism? No, this girl just told me on Friday night at the prayer that his fruit of the spirit message that she came to Jesus. Does that mean I never teach? I hope I teach because every time I open the Bible, it's necessary. It's just where the gifts isn't, the Spirit doesn't just give you one gift. He can exercise multiple gifts. Nobody has all the gifts, but we can all have some of them as he chooses to give. Uh, I, I think that this is even uh, in that, that evangelism, that witness. I, I would say that the gift of evangelism is marked supremely. When I look at Luis Palau, he's a prime example. Evangelism is almost primarily favor with people. <laughs> it's favor specifically with non-believers. It's just weird, like... Luis can go into a restaurant. Every time I eat with him, he'll talk to almost everyone at every table, and people don't mind. They're drawn to him. God has given him this supernatural favor with people, and then the clarity to communicate the gospel, and they, they believe him. He makes Jesus attractive, and he makes sin ugly, and I think that's a powerful combination. And so we look at these, these gifts, but look at this, because I, I think that if we move forward now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 11... We see that the Spirit distributes, and this is where I want to push on you, is that distribution is driven by the Spirit's sovereignty. And I want to give you a few thoughts on this. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and, st and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. Notice, they're all the work of Him, not us. And He distributes them to each one just as He determines. So this is His sovereign ability to distribute to the church as he sees fit. I want you to really quickly turn back with me now to Romans chapter 12, just so you can see there's only a few lists of gifts in the New Testament, and I just want you to know that the gifts are not exhaustive. I mean, these lists, lists are not exhaustive. I just got done saying that the Spirit can empower or animate um, any gift that is within you that can be used for the sake of the gospel. But this, is, this one's fascinating because he, he takes it even further and gets into even more natural gifts when he says, so in Christ we, Romans chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, though many form one body, each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. Notice that service can be spiritually empowered. You serve on the coffee team, the Spirit can give you joy. Not, it's not like you're going to serve, you're going to do the coffee better. than You're going to make the best spiritually filled coffee. Ever. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying, <laughs> you're like, this cup of coffee is supernatural. <laughs> it's saying that there's a, there is an attitude. There's a spiritually infused energy that comes to service where you see everything is divinely significant which changes. You know what's a bummer? Is when people aren't led by the Spirit and they sign up to serve and just don't show up. Some of you do that. Don't do that. To me, that doesn't show that you're lazy. It shows that you're not being yielded to the Spirit. Can you imagine if I didn't just show up to preach today? Sorry, I just got, I got busy. <laughs> like, we wouldn't do that. I mean, I, mean it's, I understand I'm paid, but still, I wouldn't do that. Uh, and, and, and I would do this whether I was getting paid to do it or not because it's what I'm created to do. And so I think that this is the thing. You are created to be like Jesus, and Jesus was the chief servant. I love this. And then he says, if it's teaching, then teach. Some of you guys have the gift of teaching, and you should exercise it. If someone's, in, in the, once again, the qualifier is, has it been, has it been identified in you? 
And, and I was that, that God will make room for your gifts. Um, and he says, if it's to encourage, then give encouragement. How fascinating that encouragement can be supernaturally empowered and infused. And I've seen that in action. My wife does that. Have you ever been with someone that's in counseling and they just have this ability to just make someone feel like Jesus was in the room loving that person? That's a powerful gift that, man, I would love to see exercise more in our church. I, what does it say? If it's giving, then give generously. Once again, I would love to see that exercised in the church as a supernatural gift. Um, and I pray that supernaturally the Holy Spirit gives all of you a winning lottery ticket, and then you spiritually give generously. Um, but no, the, the reality is that even our generosity can be spirit-fueled and empowered. And I, I want to be careful not to make light of these gifts because they're real. And, and we don't want to quench the Spirit. We don't want to grieve Him. We don't want to insult Him. Some people, literally, I have known people that their primary gift was financially supporting different works of Jesus. God just gives them the gift of making money, and they give it away. I know several people like that. I've been blessed to know just amazing examples to me of what generosity, spirit-filled generosity looks like. So you see these, these different kinds of gifts. Now, if you flip back with me to this 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 11, we, we come to these, this list, and he's like, miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So notice that the list in Romans seems to be very practical, and this one starts getting into those supernaturally imparted gifts where there's questions now. How do we know, and, and should we expect them? Should we expect them? And so th this is the thing. I think it's right to desire them. But it says the Spirit gives as he sees fit. I want to point out something to you, that there are times, this is where the charismatic church has gone too far, when it basically says that the reason we don't see the gifts manifested today it's because we don't believe. I don't believe that's true. I think it's true sometimes, but I do not believe that is always true at all. I think that the Holy Spirit is sovereign. When Martin Luther brought about the Reformation, it wasn't driven by signs and wonders and tongues. It was driven by a, a newfound commitment to the gospel that literally turned the world upside down on its head. And I can promise you that that was spirit-filled and fueled. It's because that's what the Spirit sovereignly did in that time. I look at the world today. I've had the opportunity to travel around the world, and I have seen areas in the world where the Spirit is doing crazy stuff that would make all of us really uncomfortable. I remember last, a couple years ago, having the opportunity to spend some time with this Iranian girl named Nesteron, who in Iran at 18 years old, taking a shower, and she hears a voice that says, says, put your faith in the Messiah and be cleansed by his blood. She's Muslim. What does that mean? I'm sitting across the table because I wanted to hear it out of her own lips. And, she, and she, she doesn't know what it means, so she goes to the iman. And she asks him, she said, I, a voice, I heard a, a spirit speak to me. And he said, what did, what did, he, what did he say? And she said, said, to put my faith in the Messiah and be cleansed of my sins by the blood. And he said, that's the prophet Jesus, only he talks like that. That's weird. Then she goes, she goes home and she begins thinking about this thing and she starts reading the Koran looking for passages about Jesus. And while this is happening, her, her sister has gone to uh, Europe and is has the gospel shared with her, and she has a radical conversion, unbeknownst to the family, because she was hiding it from the family, because it's not safe to be a Christian in Tehran. And while her sister is at a Christian event, uh, like some college-age gathering, some woman, random woman, walks up to her, puts cash in her hand, and says, the Lord just told me to give you this money, you're to fly home and share the gospel with your family. She's like, whoa, that's crazy. So she gets a ticket, flies home immediately, shows up at the door. Her mother opens the door. She shares the gospel with her mom and with her sister. But this is the fascinating thing. Her mom brings her into the bedroom 
of Nestron. And what does Nestron say? You're here to tell me about Jesus. I believe in him, but I need to know more. Her and her mom come to saving faith in Jesus, but the dad still is unsure. He then, a month later, has a dream in which Jesus reveals himself to him. Nestron says she asked her dad what he was wearing, and he said, a bright robe. And she said, was it white? And he goes, it wasn't white. It was a color I've never seen before, but it was bright. <laughs> Let's go crazy. And then I'm like, that's not my reality. This is how you came to faith. That's not how I came to faith. This is the crazy thing is she's part of a Baptist movement that doesn't even believe in the gifts of the Spirit. But what is, she has no explanation for this. And she tells the people, and like, like, I don't know, they just probably think it's a little weird, but that's how Jesus rolls in Iran. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, I, you know, this is the reality. And what's fascinating is the, this couple, there's been so radically used by Jesus, their pastor was executed. Their best friend is in prison for life with a wife and, and toddlers uh, it, who will never get out of prison for his faith in Jesus unless something, some revolution happens that it becomes acceptable. And they had to flee. They were themselves imprisoned and tortured, and they, they got out and fled, ended up in Dubai, discipled by Max Stiles, who we support as a church. And then, and then now they're in L.A., and I get... I get emails from him regularly, and it's just incredible to me, the miraculous ways. I mean, think about Tim and I, like, there's many things that we've been uncomfortable with. I think about this, this statement about the, that there are signs and wonders. We, we have seen firsthand in the, last, in the last five months, we saw demonic possession. I get a call from Tim that I have to go to the hospital, and there's a woman in the hospital a part of our body that's come under demonic, and the doctors don't even know what's going on. And Tim, Tim was utterly skeptical about this, and so, and really, in many ways, so was I. But then we were confronted with it, and we're like, "Whoa! Like this is out of my." And the first thing this person did was smack the Bible out of my hand and started acting like the Exorcist, except she didn't crawl on the ceiling. And and I was like, "This is crazy!" And all of a sudden, Tim and I just felt like I just remember what Gary told me: tell it to leave in the name of Jesus. Don't pray to it. And then pray, thank Jesus that he heard our prayer. And, and I laid my hand on her forehead. It became so scalding hot that the heart monitor started to beep like crazy and was about to flatline. And I said, in the name of Jesus, unclean spirit, leave this woman. And she let out this weird scream and it left. And then her and I were laughing with Tim. And then Tim called me. He goes, I don't know what to make of that. You know what it reminded both of us of? Because we both went like, did that actually happen? Did that happen? I don't know. And then uh, I was driving once through the middle of the night through Utah, and I, was, I got to this single lane, and a panther, a cougar, jumped in front of our van, and we slammed on our brakes, and me and Adam are sitting in the front, and it's like a stinking seven-foot lion in the middle of the freeway in America. And I'm like, and, and we're like, go, guys, guys, look, look, before they could even get their heads up, the cougar jumped over the median and ran away. And then I'm like, the guy's like, you didn't see a cougar. I'm like, I did. It was right there. It was, look, he wanted to eat me. And, and then I'm like, maybe, maybe I didn't see a cougar. Did I, was that just, did you and I, Adam, just have a hallucination? That's how we treat, because it's not normal what that, when that happened. That wasn't normal. And so my natural inclination, I admit, is to, is to explain those things away. But we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that he died for our sins. We believe that he sent his spirit. At least we've been saying that. So why doesn't he do these things? Is there anywhere in the scripture that says that he does not do these things? No. What was half of Jesus' ministry marked by? The casting out of demons. So here's the thing. When we look at these things, healing, another one. I had the shingles. Jesus didn't heal me of the shingles. I wish he would have. But I came with a crook in the neck that I couldn't even look up during first service. And lovely little Emily Dauber, who was just sitting here in the first service, she... After she saw me walking like this, and she said, I just feel like I'm supposed to pray for you. She laid her hand on my neck, prayed for me, and it was gone within 20 minutes. And I was like, I, I remember thinking to myself, you know what? It probably was just, she's just so friendly that it gave me like extra awesome confidence. And that communicated to my brain that I'm okay, but probably actually isn't okay, even though I can move my head fully right now. I mean, I'm just in my own head trying to explain away this incredible thing that just happened. God wants to do amazing things 
through us. But he's sovereign, and he can do it when he wants, where he wants, as he pleases. And the fact is, is that I don't need signs and wonders to make my life more full. I don't. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't desire them if that's what God would have for this community. I don't need to speak in tongues to feel closer to Jesus, but we see here in the list one that creates one of the greatest discomforts and clearly was the one that was being the mis- most misused by the church and elevated to the supreme position in, uh, in the Corinthian church. And Paul noticed, noticed this. He puts tongues both in chapter 12 and in 14 as last on the list. And he says, I would rather you all speak in tongues all speak words of prophecy. And I'm like, man, that sounds just as scary to me. Um, And he goes, and speak four intelligible words than, than than a bunch of nonsense. And he doesn't even diminish the gift of tongues. He says, I speak in tongues more than any of you, but tongues, he calls it a lesser gift than prophecy because prophecy is for the community and tongues was for the individual. And I, I think it's just good if I could just speak to that for just a second because this is the thing that spirit empowered ability to praise God or pray to God in languages unknown to the user. Tongues are spoken um, to God and, and prophecy spoken to people. But I, I think of tongues when I've seen it used in a way that seems genuine and, and I've seen it used genuinely by some people that I see in front of me is that what I call it is precognitive speech. It's divine utterances. It's where, it's where the mind is unfruitful and the spirit prays. Um, one dear friend here at the church said that the way that he views tongues is that tongues almost, it always leads to cognitive prayer for him. That he begins in tongues. It's his gift. I don't have that gift, by the way. Um, but I'm, I'm done being skeptical about it because the scripture supports it. And I can't, I mean, as much as I would like to say, you can speak in tongues, actually, please don't speak in tongues ever, um, because it makes me uncomfortable, that's, that's dumb. What does the scripture say? And the way that he described it was very helpful. He said he uses it as a, as a means where his mind isn't fruitful and tongues actually focuses him, and then, and then he begins to pray with the mind. It's beautiful. Paul says... He even goes as far, and this is what makes me extremely uncomfortable, is he even leaves room still for tongues to be exercised within the community. Um, And, you know, I (laughs) I asked him, I'm like, would you be comfortable with that? And he's like, no, I'm like, me neither. But we have to preach what the Bible says. And the, the beautiful thing about the gospel is that when Jesus is Lord and he is the parameter by which we test everything, it gives us the safety to be a little messy. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm not asking you to do this for sure. But I'm saying that the Spirit, if it was to ever happen in our gathering, the, re- the requirement is there has to be an interpretation. So, well, then how do we know? That's the thing. That's why people don't, that's why often it's a very misused gift because it's very subjective. How do I know if the interpretation, once again, the interpretation must be brought under the umbrella of Jesus as Lord, and who is giving the interpretation? Is it someone who is trusted and mature within the community? All I'm saying in all of these things is that I think that our church, I think sometimes I feel like the Spirit wants to do more, but there's a part of our self-conscious age, being a church full of little hipsters who don't even like to be called hipsters because you're so self-conscious, but you actually secretly love it, is um, (laughs) is, is that you is that there's this fear of being foolish. And Paul says that he'd be a fool for Jesus. And I'm not talking about getting out of control or getting crazy. That is not, because God is a God of order, not of chaos. And these things have been misused, but it doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so I think the danger is that we, we pretend that the Spirit doesn't want to work. And just like, no, the only thing he does is regenerates and illuminate scripture. That's it. The other danger is like, I just want to see signs and wonders and gold dust. No, that's not good either. We need to come to the center and say, Jesus, we recognize that if the scripture and the gospel is all we get in regeneration, that is the greatest miracle. And and who am I to ever complain? But Holy Spirit, we're open to what you want to do because we want you to make Jesus known in our city. 
And so the final test of all of this, I want you to look at the very end. I've just got one last thing to say. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 28 through 31. And you know, there's so much more that can be said. I can't, I don't have time to go through the entire list of 20 gifts mentioned. And if you have questions on the individual gifts, it talks about the gift of knowledge, of wisdom, a word given. All of these things, once again, just put them under the umbrella. Does it exalt Jesus as Lord? That is your safety net. Does it line up with Scripture? Um, secondly, when he talks, I think the, one of the deepest needs for the church today that I wish the Spirit would pour out in fullness is discernment. <laughs> Our church needs discernment desperately to be able to discern the Spirit of God from the lies of the world. But how do we wrap it up? Well, look at the most excellent way in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Once again, he's saying that there are gifts that are greater because they, they benefit the community on a larger scale than, than the gifts that tend to be focused on the personal building up. Um, it's not that those are bad, but there are, there are gifts that are considered greater, and that's why he said desire prophecy. Um, because what he's saying is desire to be fully submitted to the Spirit where he can use you as a conduit at any moment. I think that's really what he's saying. Be so surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus that the Spirit can do what He wants through you. But then He says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And what does He say in the next chapter? What is the most excellent way? Anyone. Love. That what, if I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I'm nothing but a noisy gong. He says, what if I do signs and wonders and and I even raise people from the dead, but have not love. It means nothing. He says, what if I give my life as a martyr? I give away all my belongings and have not love. It accomplishes nothing. Love is the boundary by which we allow our gifts to flow. The gifts are exercised in love for the purpose of pushing forward the mission of Jesus in our city. Nobody will be impressed with signs and wonders if we're not marked by love. Why would we even want it? Who cares? Love is the greatest miracle when the church truly loves one another like Jesus loves, sacrificially loves. And this is why Paul says, pursue love in the first verse of chapter 14 and desire prophecy. Pursue love and then be surrendered to God to move through you powerfully. Is that our mark? Did I make you guys uncomfortable? I made myself uncomfortable. But I think God wants to do a lot of awesome stuff <laughs> that Jesus might be exalted and glorified in our city and through our city. I want to see hundreds of thousands saved. I want Portland to be known for this, the Christian city in a good way the place where people love Jesus more than they love riding naked on bicycles. Amen? Let's pray. <laughs>